Okay, I've got to admit that I probably showed a bit too much love to B cells, so it's now time to turn our attention to T cells. Part of our episode five, by the end you should be able to um, answer these questions. Um, we're talking about CD4, CD8, and MHCs. Okay, so B cells and T cells, B cells and T cells are both made in the bone marrow by stem cells. B cells are going to stay there and mature there, and that's why they're called B cells, B for bone marrow. And T cells, they're going to migrate early on into your neck, uh, into a bit called the thymus, not thyroid to thymus, and they mature there. So the, the T cells, they do their VTJ recombination and like tolerance and all that in the um, thymus. That's why they're called T cells. Okay. So um, B cells and T cells are kind of similar. So I've got the structure of B cell here just to uh, remind you. We've got our B cell receptor, which becomes an antibody later on. And then also we've got, this is my point, we've got um, co-stimulatory IG alpha and IG beta um, kind of receptors. And these kind of work just to double check that when an antigen binds, that everything's okay. And they tell the cell that, yep, an antigen has bind. So you go do your thing, you're all right. Um, obviously we know a structure of an antibody. We've got a heavy chain and light chain, a variable region, a constant region. Um, and then obviously that makes up your antigen binding site and then your FC constant kind of straight bit. Um, and obviously they're held by their cell bridges and it's asymmetrical structure. On your T-cell, it's kind of analogous um, because you also have a constant region and a variable region. However, uh, you have to note that the T-cell receptor is shorter as it's not secreted, so the B-cell receptor is eventually going to become an antibody, so it's longer, the T-cell receptor is shorter. Um, okay, and like the uh, B-cell has a heavy chain and light chain, the T-cell has two chains, as you can see, it has an alpha chain and a beta chain. So the alpha chain is similar to the light chain and the beta chain is similar to the, to the heavy chain. And what that means is remember the light chain only has V and J recombination in the B cell because it's light it kind of skips out one of the courses on the many. The B cell is heavy and the heavy chain has VTJ. So the alpha chain only has VJ segments and the beta chain on the T cell receptor only has VTJ uh, segments. So that's why the beta chain is similar to the heavy chain and the alpha chain is similar to the light chain. But be specific with the terminology. Don't call this the light chain, call this the alpha chain. Okay, the thing is with the T cell VTJ recombination, um, there's more VTJs to choose from. So there's more things on the menu. Essentially, there can be more combinations. Um, therefore, there can be a greater diversity of receptor. Therefore, the receptor is even more specific than the antibody. So if you thought the antibody was specific, the T cell receptor is even more specific. So therefore, it won't recognize the antigen because that's not specific enough. It will only recognize short pe peptide sequences on the antigen. And those are known as epitopes. So for example, if a whole antigen comes along in a different configuration, the T cell will not be able to recognize it. It can only recognize this kind of portion of the antigen. Okay. Um, so in terms of VTJ recombination, the actual process is kind of the same. Uh, and also things like recombinational inaccuracies, they both occur in B-cells and T-cells at the time of VTJ recombination, but there is no somatic cell hypermutation in T-cells um, as opposed to B-cells. Okay, similar to the IG-alpha and the IG-beta um, kind of co-stimulatory receptors, you also have uh, co-stimulatory receptors on your T-cells, and those are called CD3. Essentially, they're a group of proteins that have crazy Greek letters, and they also double-check that when an, anti when an epitope has bound to your T-cell receptor, they give the T-cell the go-ahead that, like, everything's all good. So this uh, kind of double-checking mechanism, um, they're called CD3s, and they're made of three individual components with Greek letters, so the epsilon delta, then this is called zeta, and then gamma epsilon. I'm not sure you actually need to know the Greek letters, but anyway. Um, and those form a cluster of proteins called the CD3, and those kind of uh, sit on the surface of a T-cell receptor and just double check that when something is bound into it, that the T-cell is good to go. Okay, so we said that T-cell receptors have the alpha and the beta chain. Just to be extra though, there are some T-cells they don't have an alpha beta chain, they have a gamma delta chain. Um, literally, that's all you need to know. You know, don't need to know any details about them. You need to know that they exist and that they're extra. And instead of following the normal rules, they have different names for the chains, but that's all you need to know. Every time I talk about T cells, I'm talking about these guys. These are the majority of T cells. These guys, they're not really that important. Okay, uh, right. So when I'm talking about T cells, uh, there's essentially two types of these alpha beta T cells, CD4 cells and CD8 cells. They have two jobs. So CD4 cells, um, they basically alert. Their job is to kind of find antigen presenting cells and then when they've detected an antigen on the cells, they're going to trigger an immune response to tell other cells what to do. CD8 T cells, they're kind of more brutal. They find an antigen on a cell, and that's going to be a cell with it that's being infected by a virus. So any normal cell, not an immune cell. Say that cell has a virus in it, CD8 cell is going to come along on its patrol, find that this cell has a distress signal, and then kill it. So it's cytotoxic. CD8 is cytotoxic. It's a stupid way of remembering it, but CD4, 4 for phone, I guess maybe similar phonetics. So CD phones in the other cells. And the CD4 cells are activated by antigen present presenting cells, like macrophages or um, even B cells. Okay, so you might have heard of MHC. Essentially, the antigen presenting cells or your normal cell needs a way of presenting that ultra specific epitope to your T cell. Um, and that is done via a glycoprotein called MHC. And the job of that is. Okay, so I'm quite proud of that. Um, here we have an antigen presenting cell. Uh, like a macrophage, for example, it's come along and gobbled up an antigen here. And essentially, it needs to process this antigen into a way that it can present it as an epitope, a short peptide sequence, so that your T cell uh, can recognize it and then call for help. So that's the point of MHC, is to, like told, to call for help. So um, the MHC is essentially, I think of it like tongs. It's able to pick up a peptide sequence and then present it on the outside to a T cell. So it's picked up a peptide sequence, presented it to a T cell, 
a CD40 cell, which is kind of floating around, it goes, whoa, look, there's a tongue here sticking out with an epitope. That just so happens to fit into my T cell receptor. And essentially, that is a mechanism of two-step verification. So that sounds the alarm bells. And rather than the, the, the antigen-presenting cell activating the immune response itself, um, that can go wrong sometimes. So this two-step verification basically ensures that you don't have an immune response when you don't need to. This kind of, these tongues, um, the ones that the antigen-presenting cells use, they're called MHC class 2. So um, MHC is also called HLA. And this, these are essentially tongues. So um, they're coded for by one of the genes um, in chromosome 6. So there's slight variations. For example, you could have like green tongues, blue tongues, red tongues, but they all kind of pick up the same kind of epitopes. Um, you, you're either going to have an A or B or C um, type of MHC. And essentially, these genes are very polymorphic. So even within those categories, polymorphic means that each individual has a lot of mutations within those genes. So essentially, each individual has a different pair of tongues. So they'll be each each individual will be able to pick up slightly different types of peptides and present them, even if you have the same original um, bacteria or pathogen with the same original antigen. Your tongues are slightly different, so your MHCs are slightly different, so they're going to present slightly different peptides for each individual to the T cell. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so that's one type of T cell. The other type of T cell is your cytotoxic T cell. And that's going to come along to cells that are infected with a virus in it. So that's in normal cells, non-immune cells. Also, dendritic cells here as well. And so cells with virus or um, dendritic cells. And essentially, these guys are going to have proteins in them that are from the virus, so unhealthy proteins, and they are going to have a tongue as well. And with those tongues, they're going to grab up any proteins that are not kind of they're not used to, and stick them on the surface, waiting for a CD8 cell to come along and kill it. So there should be an epitope there, which I haven't put. Um, and those tongues are via the MHC class 1. Um, so in the antigen-presenting cell, it uses a type set of tongues called the class 2 to hold that specific epitope. For the cell with the virus in it, it's going to use the MHC class 1, and this uh, fits into a CD8 T cell, which binds to it and then kills that cell. Um, this is slightly complicated. Your MHC class 1, that is obviously a protein, and proteins are coded for by genes. Those genes uh, are also found in chromosome 6, and you have essentially three genes that can code for it, and your body will pick two of those genes, for example, DQ and DS, or DR and DS, or D... Yeah, that's it. Um, it will pick a combination of two of those genes to code for this, um, for this, for these tongues. And so each, and then on top of that, within individuals, there's mutations as well, which mean that each individual DQ might be different to, my DQ might be different to your DQ. So even if I end up picking a DQ and a DR, there's going to be um, mutations. And essentially, again, um, so that there's variation within MHCs. So that essentially that variation is a good thing because it means that lots of different types of epitopes will be able to be picked up. And because lots of different types of epitopes can be picked up um, between different cells, um, then hopefully you will be able to pick up an epitope which matches the um, CD8 or the CD4. Okay. Um, okay. So we're going to be talking about the this this guy's first, the CD4 um, presentation. So remember we said that the T cell receptor can only recognize a short peptide sequence and not the whole antigen. So um, your first thing that is going to be an antigen-presenting cell is going to be your gobbler uppers, for example, your macrophages. And remember, your macrophages are part of the innate immune response. They have a broad-spectrum receptor. So this receptor, this receptor is able to recognize not only one type of antigen, but lots of different types of antigens that share kind of similar sequences. And remember, this is your innate response guy. This is your kind of old man floating around, waiting for things. And he's able to pick up lots of different types of antigens because this toll-like receptor 4 is able to recognize lots of different sequences. So this is an example of a pattern recognition receptor. And upon recognizing an antigen, essentially it will endocytose it, so phagocytose it, uh, and then absorb that antigen, and essentially chop it up and then present it via MHC2. So it's now presented this triangle here. Then a T-cell uh, comes along, we'll go into more detail how this happens um, in, in a few minutes. T-cell comes along and is like, okay, something's wrong, sounds the alarm, two-factor authentication, and then it basically activates an immune response. So compared to your toll like receptor, so your macrophage receptor, this macrophage receptor is non-specific. It can recognize multiple types of antigens. The T cell receptor is so specific, it can't even recognize an antigen. It can only recognize a short peptide sequence on the antigen. And that is the purpose of this MHC thingy, to present that short peptide sequence. Another type of antigen presenting cell, which um, activates CD4 T cells, is actually B cell. So B cell, you may not know this, um, actually can present an antigen. So it has an antibody this receptor, and that is going to encounter an antigen, the whole antigen. But unlike the macrophage, remember a B cell can only recognize one type of antigen. So in terms of specificity order, the toll-like receptor on your innate cells is your least specific, um, therefore least diverse. Your B cell receptor has greater diversity, so therefore it can be more specific, and is specific to only one antigen. And your T cell receptor is even more ultra-specific, has more VDJ recombinations, essentially more possibilities of combinations, so it has, can show a greater diversity, and therefore, because of greater diversity, is more specific, so it only binds to a certain aspect of the um, antigen, only epitope. Okay, so your B cell, after recognizing an antigen, it's going to do the same thing, ingest it, break it down, and then use the tongs on MHC class 2 to pick up those proteins, put them on the outside of the cell. T cell is going to come along 
um, CD40 cell and activate the main response or uh, two-factor authentication essentially. We're going to now talk how that happens in more detail. So the CD4 activation, so when you're telling the immune system that you need help, um, this happens in antigen presenting cells, so macrophages, B cells, um, not dendritic cells, so that's why I put most professional immune antigen presenting cells. So they are going to encounter an antigen on the outside, for example, and recognize it from their receptor, be that be cell receptor or tobacco receptor, and therefore they're going to um, have endocytosis, basically endocytose the antigen and bring it inside within the cell. And when this whole juicy antigen is inside the immune cell, so this is specific to immune cells, a protease is going to come, um, put these in an endosome, and then kind of chop these up into protein fragments. So you can see that the antigen has been chopped up into its respective kind of components. Meanwhile, while this is happening, happening the endoplasmic reticulum, which is like your protein factory, is making a glycoprotein called the MHC2, and that is like the tongs, which are able to pick up peptides. And basically, the MHC2 gets towed away from your endoplasmic reticulum by something called the invariant chain. So the invariant chain, see, I call it the invariant chain, uh, comes along, picks up, if you haven't noticed, I use everything as analogies. The invariant chain train comes along and picks up the MHC class 2 and goes in the right direction. At the same time, an antigen, um, a peptide from the antigen also kind of makes its way and it meets and marries the MHC2 and those are bound together. Then what happens is your invariant chain detaches and leaving your MHC class 2, which is bound to your epitope, and this migrates to the membrane and therefore presents the MHC class 2 uh, epitope with the epitope on the subsurface. Um, for a T cell to come and pick it up and then amplify this response. So you should be familiar with this. Uh, maybe pause this and just kind of repeat this in your head a few times. So this is how antigen presenting cells present an antigen um, to a T cell. And the different types of CD4 T cells that it can recruit are particular helper cells, TH1 cells, TH2 cells, and TH17 cells. We'll talk about those in a different video. Okay, we're now moving on. So remember, there's the other way that um, you can attract T-cells, and that is if you have a normal cell, so not an immune cell, and that's infected by a virus, and you want to kind of tell the T-cell that I need help, I need to be killed. So you have an, a normal um, body cell, which has been infected by a virus, or a dendritic cell. So instead of, this is called the endogenous route now, because you have an antigen not on the outside, so you don't have phagocytosis or endocytosis, you have the virus already inside the uh, cell. And basically viral replication is going to cause replication of the viral antigens, so the big proteins, and those are going to be captured by an organelle called the proteasome. And the proteasome captures these antigens and contains proteases. So the proteasome is unique to the infected normal cells. It doesn't immune, the antigen presenting cells do not have the proteasome. The proteasome then breaks down these, uh, these into peptides. It's pretty similar from here. There's a few differences. The peptides are secreted from the proteasome and they go directly into the endoplasmic reticulum. So that doesn't actually happen with the exogenous route. Remember, they meet kind of in the middle in the cytoplasm. But here, the um, protein peptide segments are brought into the endoplasmic reticulum by a transporter called the TAP transporter, and that is where uh, MHC1 is being made, not MHC2, MHC1. So those are kind of married together in the endoplasmic reticulum, and then they are secreted through a vesicle called the transgolgi vesicle, and it takes them out, and so these guys are kind of married now, and so there's no, um, there's no train, yeah, okay, uh, I forgot what it's called, but yeah, there's no train, and variant chain. Okay. Um, and this trans-Golgi vesicle is going to fuse with membrane and then present the MHC class 1, which is married to the epitope, onto the surface. And then along comes a CD8 T cell, which is able to recognize this MHC class 1. So CD8 can only recognize MHC class 1. And it kind of learns this in the finest, which we'll talk about in the, in the tolerance video. CD8 can bind to the epitope and then is like, okay, thank you for telling me that I need to kill you. And then basically kills the cell or kills any other cell that are also um, putting out the same MHC class 1. Okay, remember each individual, it might help to think about the individual thing here. So say the virus is producing multiple proteins. These salad tongs will not be able to pick up all of those proteins because they're, they can only fit up, pick up certain shapes. Um, so they can pick up lots of different shapes, but still they have to be, like for example, salad tongs will not be able to pick up a melon, for example, right? Maybe I'm just waffling. If I'm not waffling, just listen. So salad tongs can only pick up, they can pick up a variety of things, but they have to be the same shape. So they can pick up a variety of different kind of peptides, but because each uh, they won't be able to pick up like vastly different peptides. That's why we have variation in them, like polymorphisms and the DQ and the DRS and whatever, so that we can have different kind of size salad tongs as well, and therefore get the maximum number of epitopes presented on the outside to present, and hopefully a CD8, one CD8 will recognize that, and therefore be able to kill this and kill other cells. Okay, um, this is comparing both of these ways uh, to activate CD4 and CD8 cells. Um, have a look at these and can spot the difference, um, especially, so the endogenous route does not have MHC2, it uses MHC1, and the way I remember it is MHC1, CD8. Uh, CD4, MHC2, so they both times together to make 8. Uh, CD4 times 2 is 8, and CD8 times MHC1 is 8. So if you're ever stuck confused remembering them, uh, remember the rule of 8. So the CD8 cells rely on the MHC1 
uh, and those that internal relies on the tap transporter. Um, there's no invariant chain, the word I forgot, uh, in the endogenous route, um, and there's no transcoggy vesicle, likewise, in the antigen presenting cells. Okay, that should be everything. There are some questions that we saw at the start, and here are the answers.